Well, this claims to be the oldest apartment block in Victoria, actually, from the early 1900s. And we're right here in James Bay, a few blocks just up from the Strait of Juan de Vuca. Well, I've been here for some time now. You know, I started uh, living here when I worked for the Royal British Columbia Museum as their chief curator for the Gold Rush exhibit back in 2015. Ideal for a writer to be in a funky old place such as this, you know, close walking distance to the museum. Yeah, it did very well. I was pleased. Um, the reception, you know, I was fortunate it won three, three major awards, actually. Um, it was very gratifying for me to write that book. Of course, it was born of my doctoral work at UBC. I suppose in large measure because of my family's history here on Vancouver Island and in British Columbia, having come with the Fraser River Gold Rush of 1858, it was nice to, to, to write a book that I felt was essential, you know, to, to tell the history of this major, in many ways, founding event for our province, the 1858 Gold Rush. It led to the founding of British Columbia. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a passion of mine since I was a young fellow, you know. Anything related to British Columbia history, it's uh, very much in my bones, you might say. Now, this isn't, this is related to British Columbia in an indirect way, perhaps. But this little statue here of a gold miner actually was for the 100th anniversary of the discovery of gold in California in 1848. You know, I have a new book coming out shortly uh, this April called Untold Tales of Old British Columbia. And, and these are stories that uh, came out of my writings for the Orca. British Columbia, to, to really understand it more fully, it has to be placed in this north-south perspective, this Pacific Slope perspective. And if we cast our minds back to the gold rush period, uh, really, the Rocky Mountains, this impenetrable barrier. I mean, who was coming from Canada at that time? Well, you know, not many. Obviously, obviously some fur traders and whatnot. And so British Columbia, to my mind, to my thinking, even with having joined Canada, remained such an isolated area. You know, the, the Trans-Canada Highway wasn't fully completed till I think about 1971. Can you imagine that? And so British Columbia and where we are today, Victoria, has continued, had continued to have this maritime focus uh, down towards Washington, Oregon, California for sure, San Francisco, well into the 20th century. The, the California gold rush starts it all, of course. I mean, if these things hadn't happened, um, the Fraser River Gold Rush would not have happened. We may not have had a place called British Columbia. I tra was traveling up uh, up the island towards Qualicum and uh, purchased this old cabinet. In fact, it's actually the top of a uh, grandfather clock from, a, I think it's around 1850s. And uh, so I, you know, having a bit of a creative spirit, I. I adorned it with uh, the t part of the title for my new book, Untold Tales of Old British Columbia. And I've been collecting for a while now, you know, the old coat of arms. That's actually a pin from about the 1920s. I continue to collect anything to do with the, uh, certainly the British Columbia centennial of 1958. It fascinates me, um, you know what items were used to represent the centennial year. I've talked a little bit about that, of course, in my previous book, Claiming the Land. It might be the perfect way to present history in these divided times in which we're in today. I wanted to have this to display some of these extraordinary items in preparation for when the book, the new book, comes out in April. Now this cabin I purchased from a, a, a nice chap who lived in uh, ESO Schofield's house, the uh, early provincial librarian for the province. And they were, they were um, created specifically to 
highlight the centennial dollar, the totem dollar of 1958. I gather then Premier W.A.C. Bennett really was putting the heat on the national government to do something in 1958, in this case this coin, to tell to the rest of Canada that, hello, here we are. So that's a lovely piece. That was actually cast in Victoria uh, by Jeffries and Company. And these ordinarily would be sitting on a wooden base, many instances painted green and presented. These plaques would be presented to various citizenry in British Columbia who had worked so hard on the uh, preparing the centennial celebrations. This may be the earliest commemorative of the Fraser River Gold Rush that I have yet to have found. This, this is a 1908 medal. I, I suspect this would have been produced in 1908 to coincide with the unveiling of the Simon Fraser statue in New Westminster. Premier, Premier McBride was there at that time. And so this, this medal uh, was struck to commemorate not only the 100th anniversary of Simon Fraser's voyage down the river, you know, that has his name in 1808, Jubilee of gold found in Fraser River. There you go. And of course, that's the very early crest of British Columbia there. Over top a depiction of the Fraser River itself. He's, I have a variety of old plates. Here's one. Early view of Victoria. And this is what was important to people back then. How do we make our history? What is our story? You know, we're living in a time where the national story has been greatly questioned. And for myself, I find it's very easy to tear down old narratives. My concern right now is what do you replace them with? And I think that's where we are today. What, what's the new narrative that will help us go forward? Nevertheless, this is what was important back then, and as you can see here, the usual cast of characters. Captain George Vancouver here on the left, Simon Fraser on the right. The SS Beaver at the bottom, for instance, you know, the, the, these individuals, these explorers, or this first steamship on the uh, coast here, these were important people, considered to be very important and uh, of very important achievements. Now, as a fifth generation British Columbian myself, I certainly still feel they are important. I've worked uh, for decades now, hoping to find a more inclusive story for this province. Uh, but let's face it, I still would have within my own family history, the memory the memory of, let's say, the loss of the San Juan Islands just, uh, just over here, you know, uh, just through the Strait of Juan de Fuca, when, uh, when those were uh, taken in, well, not taken in 1859, but all ultimately fell to the United States. Or Old Oregon, you know, the British claim, which there was an expectation that the boundary would go down the natural river corridor of the Columbia River as a divide between the United States and British Columbia. I could say Canada, but Canada didn't, wasn't out here in these years. And uh, it's just amazing, you know, you have this ab rather abstract 49th parallel being drawn across a map, severing all of these transboundary uh, rivers, or indigenous populations, or indeed communities that uh, came from gold rush communities all up and down this coast. What was unique about this side of the line? Well, one, slavery had been abolished already, right, long time ago. There was equality under the law for all, right? Might not have been perfect, but we're talking the very earliest years. These are stark contrast as compared to what have been occurring down in places like California or indeed Oregon, you know.
This old Viewmaster has been in our family since before I was born. If you get a close up there, there's a, a reel of the Fraser Canyon, Alexandra Bridge, whatnot. And yes, I do have this in this book right off the stop because what I, my book, my new book is not unlike a cabinet of curiosities. You know, I've got 50 years or so tales in there. And, and so I do have some of these old artifacts to encourage the reader to join me in discovering some mysteries here, some interesting tales, and some basic information on how we came to be. For the Chinese people, we have the oldest Chinatown in Canada right here, right here. And why did they come? Because they were being per persecuted in California. They were given equality under the law. So I write about that and some of those important, uh, perhaps forgotten stories I, I'm attempting to retell and tell to a much wider audience than, you know, the ivory towers as they are today.